Arts friends from all over Europe, may I uh, call on your attention for a few brief moments before we start this meeting. I want to welcome you all to Brussels. Thank you for taking the time in your busy weeks to come here and share this conference on European Internet Governance and beyond with us. It's been a long road to get here. We have tried to gather as many pirates as we can from as many countries in the European Union as we can to share this moment of, of coming together and sharing experiences of contemporary internet and digital problems for Europe. <coughs> Tomorrow at 1400, we will start a six-hour conference on the present-day problems for European Internet governance. We have some very important discussions coming up in the next legislature, not the least of which is the copyright reform, which is the reason why we are all sitting here together today. But we also have some major decisions to be made about how we deal with top-level domain systems and registrars and liability, who should be able to request that something is taken off the internet. These are discussions which will be progressing over the course of this year in Brazil, in Istanbul, in the United States, and of course in the European Union. We want to provide some of the foremost experts in Europe for your benefit so that also you can be a greater part of the international community and the discussions which are ongoing in this field at this time. And we hope that you will uh, appreciate the program that we have set together and that you will be able to bring the most back to your member states from the discussions that we are organizing here. Tonight, we have invited three distinguished pirate speakers to set the tone for our meetings tomorrow. I will call them up on the stage, one after the other. Um, our first speaker is Anke Domscheit Berg, who is standing in for her husband, Daniel, a prominent internet activist from Germany who, among other things, initiated the Open Leaks project, which followed up on WikiLeaks. Daniel, to my understanding, unfortunately is ill and cannot be with us tonight, but Anke has promised that she will provide um, that she will deliver the speech that he had made. And so I welcome up on stage um, Anke domscheit Berg, who is also the uh, third candidate on the Piraten Partei list for the European elections. Um, and I, I hope that you will enjoy her presentation. Thank you very much. Well, I know it's kind of weird talk the speech of somebody else, but at least we share the same last name. Um, to make it a bit more complicated, my husband wanted to incorporate in his speech uh, a little speech from Peter Sunde. So I do that for him too, uh, expect a nested speech, so to say, a speech Matryoshka style. Um, and I'd like to start with uh, the message Peter Sunde is bringing to us. Dear friends, many of you know me as one of the founders of the Pirate Bay. I've been working closely with a lot of the people in this audience for over a decade. I was hoping to be able to come to this meeting, but I can't. The reasons are at the core of the things we need to fight. Because of the skewed and broken legal system. Oh, this one. I'm sentenced to prison for a crime that is not supposed to be a crime. A crime that in its pure essence boils down to challenging authority. Challenging the big corporations over their power and influence, giving back the power of information to the people. When we started the Pirate Bay, we had no idea what it would lead to. We were young and we didn't agree with anyone, not even each other. The internet was not as regulated as today, and there was no caring about the politics of the maps. Today, the world looks different. The internet is the new oil industry, where the wealth is the information about normal people being collected for profits. The tools that we once built in good faith for sharing 
have become weapons against our own freedom and privacy. The regulations are coming and they are not for the people's benefits. The politics of the net is now the politics of the world. All the people in this audience understand this. You all know the problems we have. You are all eager to change things so that we can build a society for the people, not against them. Our mission has broadened from being just about the internet and our freedom to share to saving democracy. Within the Pirate Bay, we were never really friends, and we actually hated each other quite a lot sometimes. But our goals made us focus on the important tasks and put our own quarrels aside. We had other arenas for those. The more influence we got, the more important it was to stick to our goals. I feel it's important to send a message to you. All that cooperation and focus is the only way to change things. The European Pirates is a great step at finding a common ground for this cooperation. Just as the Green Movement, our political goals are global and can't be defined by borders. Politics is a long-term commitment. It's going to take time to reach the results we want. But just look at the people in this audience. Look at the results you've already achieved in such a small time frame for being politics. Today, I wish I could be there with you guys to celebrate because it's very deserved for all of us. That was the first bit of my question. And now comes the speech of my husband, Daniel von Schenkberg. Wait, excuse me, can you sit down so we get your picture in the It monitor? doesn't matter no, because I we have our own good. video records. So Sorry? it's better, I think, to stand up. Because so we don't see her in the monitor and there is no light. So we don't see her lips. So what should I do? Can we just do this thing? Can't you adjust the other camera so that everybody can see? But these, these cameras are not related to these screens at all. So these are independent cameras from those yeah, so things that are unadjusted. So you can adjust the camera and everybody else can see my face. Yep. These, are, these are not linked to those monitors. Yeah, but the monitor now has my face. Okay. <laughs> Is it a problem for anyone with me sitting now? No. no. So I do sit. <laughs> and I'm now my husband. Hi, everyone. It's quite an honor for me to speak at this very historic moment of pirate history. There are plenty of things I would like to say, given the travel times we live in, in the real world, but unfortunately also in our party. Back at WikiLeaks, we had a credo that history is the only guidebook civilization has. I think whenever it is unclear where something is headed, it makes sense to look back where we came from, to remember what unites us, so we can move forward together and in unity. So I would like to share a short story with you. In the late 90s, a young and innocent Unix enthusiast became part of a circle of people referred to as the Wares Sea. The scene was a group of people that had started to use the means of the internet quite early and had developed an ecosystem for the distribution of content, mainly music, movies, at some stage, books and magazines. That scene was a first incarnation of an alternative ecosystem in a purely digital sphere. It was a first effort to reorganize reorganize the distribution of and access to content to overcome societal and technical limitations imposed by the existing regime. Unfortunately, that scene looked much like the existing world. It was top-down, virtually organized, as one could imagine, highly competitive and highly professionalized. Just as our real world, it was made for an elite this time just spelled in numbers. This hierarchy was no coincidence, but a mere consequence of the scarcity of resources 
fast lines and bandwidth, fast servers, and most importantly, storage. Around the year 2000, something in the game started to change. In time for the new millennium, the broadband future had arrived in Sweden. Broadband as in 10 megabits, 100 megabits at home. Svenne Svensson in his Swedish home got fiber, and more importantly, upstream to the network via an open access infrastructure that removed the bandwidth limitations. The limitations in how much he could share with Anna Svensson, John Doe, Erika Mustafau, and the rest of the world were effectively removed. Within a really short amount of time, substantial parts of the Wares ecosystem moved to Sweden. Suddenly, a world rid of physical scarcity and full of intellectual and cultural abundance had arrived, accessible not only to an elite anymore, but increasingly to everybody. Because the broadband future happened in the middle of a highly soci social society, it is no coincidence that Pirat Piran and the Pirate Bay happened in Sweden. They are nothing short of a natural consequence of the dynamic set in motion with the arrival of the digital age, and some fundamental questions this put on the table. Questions about the means of distribution, property in a digital environment. Questions from the early days of piracy. So what does this all mean? Our unique sailor in the summer of 2005 steered a ship full of sour drum and bass releases to the bay for the very first time. When strolling among all those colorful sails that had set anchor, he realized that the digital era was the world in which the exclusivity he had been looking for did not make sense anymore. He realized that his exclusive world was a lonely one. It was unjust, unfair, and no longer fitting the times. He realized that the digital age could be the end of all exclusive regimes and the beginning of an age of inclusion. That day, another sailor joined the pirate fleet. <coughs> In the internet, we are equals among equals. This is the basic implication of the internet protocol in a net neutral environment. This world is a world of inclusion, in which everyone, independent of color, sex, sexual orientation, location on the planet, or social status, is welcome to participate, and in which there is no room for discrimination, be it on packet level in a network or status in society. It is an inclusive world, and what unifies us all is that we fight for this inclusive world on all levels of society. The whole idea of this European movement is one of an inclusive regime. The fact that we are creating a European pirate party is yet another proof for the potential for a more inclusive world. We, as Europeans, have understood that we are peers among peers, not just in a technical sense. What we are talking about here are fundamental challenges to the existing system of the world. As this movement has grown into a proper political one over the last years, with parties all over the world, we have discovered those challenges and have embraced them. We have developed strong, intelligent, and sustainable positions towards topics that have an influence on all facets of humanity. We understood that technologies like 3D printing would change the distribution of the means of production. That in a world thriving on creativity and innovation, the old concepts of intellectual property protection don't make sense anymore. We also understand the imminent dangers of the mass surveillance of the global population through an exclusive group of people and the threat this poses on democracy and the possibilities for positive change towards a more inclusive society. Our strength is this movement's holistic approach with answers on all those topics. 
It is the fact that we have understood and embraced the digital era in full like no other political movement so far. Again, this is no coincidence, but consequence. We carry a unique responsibility. From where I stand, no parliament to enter is as important right now as the European Parliament. We have to remember that what is crucially important is that we live in a time that requires us to take urgent action. We have a limited window of opportunity on which we can have positive influence and in how this new digital era is shaped. We must not lose time on anything that is smaller than this vision, that is less important. We must not be distracted by anything that is irrelevant in pursuing this vision for society. We are here for a reason, and we must never forget that. We carry a responsibility for the rest of the world because we are only few who understand what is coming. As a German candidate for the upcoming EU elections, I'm giving already now all my energy and dedication for our campaign. But no candidate can win elections on her own. It takes the energy and dedication of the entire Pirate Party community to take this barrier down, to get more feet into the European door, to get more power and impact in shaping our future. Now is the time where I ask for you to get onto your feet, go out into the streets and spread word about our visions. Because now is all that matters, and only in unity we are strong enough to win this fight. Thank you. <laughs> Pirates, Spears, Anke Domscheidberg from the German Piratenpartei on behalf of Peter Schunde and her husband and herself. Another round of applause, please. Our second speaker for tonight is Julia Reda, who is the top candidate of the German Pirate Party for the European elections in 2014, former chairman of the German Junge Piraten, present chairman of the Young Pirates of Europe and a driving force for pirates all over Europe to get engaged and actively involve themselves in changing the European communities to something that works better for all of us. Please welcome up, up on stage, Julia Rida. Thank you very much for those very kind introductory words. I will, uh, of course, um, sit down to make it easier for everybody. Uh, and I could reiterate uh, what the five speakers before me have said and just go with the plus one, but uh, I find it very uh, heartwarming to see that these pirates from all across Europe are sharing some of uh, very similar ideas. But um, I would like to start by pointing out that indeed the world is changing. Um, the digital revolution, as we see it, is only beginning, but is very likely going to become more important and more disruptive than even something as profound as the Industrial Revolution. And um, what happened in the Industrial Revolution was that out of this revolution came a political movement that made sure that the benefits of technological advancement were not just going to be the benefits of the powerful. Now, what we have to ask ourselves today is who is going to play that role in the digital revolution? We are here today because we are the kind of people who see technology as a great opportunity. We do not see technology as a threat, but as something to play with and as something that has a great potential. Uh, we have seen a glimpse of a new world where everyone has free access to knowledge and culture, 
where ordinary people can connect all over the world on the internet, across borders, and form a political party and a political movement and really change the way society works. We are seeing a world where democracy is no longer just a project of a small group of elected representatives, but a project of all people. But at the same time, what we're also seeing is an unprecedented level of government surveillance online and offline. And we're seeing an increasing control of large corporations over the internet and the services that are offered on the internet. So clearly, it is not enough to simply sit back and expect that technological progress is automatically going to turn into social progress. I see a lot of people here who want to fight to make sure that the internet is a tool for empowerment. But for that fight to be successful, I think it's important to also look at the past and to look at what happened, for example, in the Industrial Revolution. Would you say today that uh, the social consequences of this revolution were shaped only by the engineers of the steam engine? I would think not. I would think similarly, if we want a free internet uh, for all and that the internet becomes a force of democratic participation, we have to be more than just a systems administrators movement. We have to look around us and there are alliances to be built everywhere. There are alliances, for example, with librarians who want to bring knowledge to all the people. Uh, we can build alliances with backpackers who want to travel a world without borders. Or we can build alliances with the groups that are fighting social injustice and all forms of discrimination. We have to be a political movement that is defined not just by our technological abilities, but by our values. We promote liquid democracy, for example, because we believe that the people have the power and that they are competent enough to make decisions for themselves and to also decide when they do not want to make decisions for themselves. We promote copyright reform because we believe that everybody has a right to share knowledge and culture of the world and that they should have a free education. And we fight the surveillance state because in a democracy the people watch the government and not the other way around. These are, to me, the values that define the pirate movement. Of course, the deep technological knowledge is important to understand many issues of internet politics. And without our technological expertise, we would be able to, unable to make smart internet policy. So by all means, we do need to continue educating ourselves on our core issues. And this is one of the things that this conference in particular is for. We should definitely have more crypto parties. We should do hackathons. We should teach the people about how the internet works. But we need to realize that the technological knowledge is not our only weapon, and it is not our strongest weapon. Our strongest weapon is the fact that we are an international movement. We are living in a world where everything is becoming globalized, except for democracy. Uh, it, I think, takes an international movement to make sure that a connected world benefits everyone, and not just the ones who are already powerful. Take, for example, the globalized surveillance. Edward Snowden has shown that uh, if one country wants to survey its own people, what it does, it simply goes to a different country and exchanges data with them. And yet, at the same time, we are told by politicians that we in Europe need to build up our security agencies in order to defend ourselves against the security agencies of the United States. This is clearly very bad advice. It is an arms race between surveillance in different countries and what we need to do to stop this arms race is to make it clear that this is not a conflict between nations, this is not a conflict between peoples, this is a conflict between governments that have gotten out of control and the people of the world. In order to stop globalized surveillance, we need globalized transparency. But how are we going to bring that about? In order to get globalized transparency, I think we need to have some um, transnational democratic institutions. So I think we do need the European Union. 
but we do not need to accept the democratic deficit of the European Union as it is right now. Instead, Instead, I call upon you all to be active in European politics and to transform the European Union from a Europe of governments into a Europe of the people. In the next years, we're going to see one of the greatest opportunities to achieve this, but also one of the greatest challenges. Uh, I would first like to talk about the challenge, and this is something that all of us should have in mind for the next years. Um, as if they had learned nothing about what happened with ACTA, the European Commission is once again involved in intransparent negotiations on a number of trade agreements. And uh, I would say the most important one of those is TTIP, the free trade agreement between the European Union and the United States. Once again, those negotiations are taking place behind closed doors. I think the greatest danger of TTIP is not that it will bring dangerous American products to European plates, because incidentally, people in America have the same fear. Um, I think the greatest danger of TTIP is that it will raise corporations to the same level as states, that the interests of the industry will have to be considered every time a new law is put forward. As with ACTA before, the scope in which we can make democratic decisions is going to be narrowed more and more by this intransparent process. And in these negotiations, although democratic rights and democratic possibilities are being given away, the public is shut out of these discussions. But, as with ACTA, we have shown that we have the ability to put a stop to TTIP. If we work together as an international movement inside the European Parliament and outside on the streets. But in the European Parliament, we can no longer just stop threats to democracy, but I think we can also make some real positive change. And as Amelia has uh, mentioned before, the great opportunity that lies before us in the next couple of years really is that we can finally reform copyright. Amelia and some of her colleagues and many, many people from civil society have been working for years to pressure that this initiative is going to come about. And finally, the European Commission has, uh, earlier this year, started a consultation on copyright. This consultation was met with overwhelming public interest. Over 10,000 people responded to this consultation, and I imagine that quite a few of them are in the audience today. So everybody who replied to the consultation, thank you. And of these 10,000 people that gave their views, uh, they all gave a positive vision on how copyright must be reformed. Uh, the Pirate Party and many civil society actors have built platforms like copywrongs.eu to make it easy to participate in this consultation. And in this way we have sort of done the job that actually the government should be doing. We have turned this consultation into a real voice of the people. The Commission is now very well advised in a time where the support for the European Union is waning to take this support seriously and to push for a copyright reform that will no longer criminalize file sharers or lock knowledge away. And to achieve this, we must put the copyright reform front and center from now on. There are not many fields in European politics where a European reform makes as much sense as with copyright. I don't think anybody understands why in France I can't take a picture of the European Parliament, which should be the most public building imaginable and put it on the internet for people to share because an architect holds the copyright of any image I take. And similarly, nobody understands why in Germany half of all the YouTube videos are blocked and are not available in your country even though the artists actually want to use YouTube for advertising. The European Union keeps telling people that we should grow together as a community of people and have the same culture and the same political sphere. And obviously, in order to be able to do that, we need to be able to share culture across borders. And this is the very important thing that we need to achieve with the copyright reform. But 
Right now, the fragmented and intransparent European copyright rules are standing in the way of that. Now we are finally seeing some activity to fix copyright. We need to take action inside the parliament and outside on the streets. In order to achieve our vision of a free society through the internet, we need to be active, we need to be more coordinated, and we need to be loud. This conference, I think, is a first step in harnessing the power of this international movement for free culture that we are building. And I encourage you all, please use the time tomorrow to listen to the experts from NGOs and from academia to broaden your horizons, because I think they have a lot of different perspectives to bring to the table that the pirate movement can really learn from. But most of all, I would like to encourage you to take the time to talk to each other, to break out of your familiar national groups and to form new connections with pirates from other countries and do your part in strengthening this global community because this international community really is our greatest strength. Let us together build a Europe that is a bit more like the internet. I want a Europe that is connected, that is collaborative and that is a community of peers. Thank you. the top candidate of the German Pirate Party. Tonight, we have the honor of having a very special keynote speaker. He was the founder of the Swedish Pirate Party in 2006, a reaction to a change in the Swedish legislation brought about by the very same directive that Julia Reda asks us to pay close attention to in the coming five years. Since 2006, he has succeeded not only in forming a political party in Sweden, but also to bring all of us together here. I would like to welcome up on the stage, Rick Falkvinger. Thank you so much, Member of the European Parliament, Anders Lotter, all staff, all volunteers, for making this possible. And I'm going to sit down so that I'm, my face <laughs> actually shows on the monitor, so even though it feels a bit strange. I would imagine a lot of us speak almost daily about tactical operational details, about we, how we go about changing the world. It's what we fight for after all. We are here to change the entire world. Nothing more and nothing less. For the better. So instead of talking about operational details, having so many prominent people here today, I would take the opportunity to remind us all how large our goal and our opportunities are. The title of this conference is Internet Governance. You see a lot of conferences called Internet Governance these days. The problem is it's a total contradiction in terms. This term, Internet Governance, that is not an internet term. Nobody on the internet would talk about internet governance. This is a governmental term. This is a corporate term. And there are reasons for that. There are reasons for that. In 2003, two writers named Searle and Weinberger wrote a short essay named World of Ends. How many in here have read that? Let's see a show of hands. World of Ends. A few scattered hands. Those of you who have not read it yet, please take the time to do so before tomorrow. World of Ends, it's a very short read. They're talking about something called what the internet is and how to stop mistaking it for something else. And describe in detail how a few actors in society are suffering from a severe case 
of repetitive mistake syndrome. This was in 2003, and they named six specific industries who, like blatant idiots, keep making the same mistakes over and over. Those six named industries are, in 2003, newspaper publishing, broadcasting, cable television, record industry, movie industry, and telephone industry. Nothing has happened for the past decade. These people keep doing the same mistakes over and over. And the reason for that is that there's a fundamental disconnect in how they see the world versus how the next generation sees the world. You will observe that these six industries can be broadly categorized into copyright industry and wannabe gatekeeper industry, with telco and cable vision in the latter category. There's this concept of permissionless innovation. Permissionless innovation. That these corporate behemoths just do not grok. Can't wrap their heads around. In their mind, innovation takes place a bit like Google's driverless cars are being developed. You have this huge corporate giant who sets out to build something new. So they go to lawmakers and say, we need these new regulations to build this fantastic new thing. And then they both go to banks and venture capitalists to raise funds for this new thing that everybody in the elite of society wants to build. This is their view of the world. This is how innovation works in their mindset. Every piece of innovation requires regulation, funding, and corporate actors. Otherwise, it cannot work, it cannot happen, it has no place in society. Then, the net happened. And these actors are left standing completely dumbfounded and still try to do as they've always done and kind of wonder why it doesn't work any longer. That, hasn't, that doesn't stop them from just keeping on trying. But the internet is not a corporation. The internet is not a department. The internet is not an entity. The internet is something much larger than that. It is an agreement. The internet is an agreement between everybody in this room and several billion other people. And it's a very simple one. At its core, this agreement is about three things. The easiest method to get message A, or a message from point A to point B. The idea that everybody in this agreement is forwarding these messages at a best effort basis. And the principle that every message and every participant in the network is equal. This agreement makes no difference whatsoever whether one of its messages comes from the President of the United States or the European Union or from a doorknob in Nigeria. And that's one of the beautiful things about it. And here's, here's where this misunderstanding comes into play. Because governments have a self-image. Governments define themselves by what they regulate. Corporations define themselves and their power by what they own. So governments want to control the internet because it's beautiful and useful. Corporations want to own the internet. But it doesn't work that way, does it? So this is why we are seeing what gatekeepers want to be, in particular telco industry, just put a, put a lid on it, trying to prevent this utility, this beautiful agreement that we have. Like they could just stand in the middle and say, no, you may not agree to that because we don't like it. That's a real threat today. 
I'm certain we'll, we'll circumvent it sooner or later, but time is not on our side here. Governments are threatening the internet for the exact same reason. If we can't regulate it, we're going to try anyway and, and apply as much violence as it takes and make as many examples out of people as it takes until we've regulated this thing. Because that's what we do. Legislators make laws. It's what they do. But there are a few good forces that understand this on a conceptual level and everything that it brings to the table. There are a few good forces that understand that the internet is not, was not built to be governed. That the internet was not built to be controlled. The internet was not built to be controlled, and it was not built to be owned. It was built to connect people. And that brings beautiful possibilities. The good forces who understand this are few and far between so far. And the finest hope for humanity at this point sits in this very room, because this is not just about the European Union, and I really want to highlight that. While we are talking about founding an organization for the European Union, it's important to remember that the European Union is the largest economy on the planet. Whatever rules are set in Europe, others will follow. Either because they see it as good as examples to follow, or, in most cases, because they don't have any other choice when it comes to loosening restrictions. The restriction, any restriction that Europe doesn't agree, great, agree to on the internet does not exist in practice. That gives us a beautiful window of opportunity here. Because this, at the end, this isn't just about Europe. We, yes, we are fighting for ourselves. Yes, we have been fighting for our, from our own experiences. Yes, we, uh -huh, we understand this because we live it on a daily basis. But it's so much larger than that. We are talking about freeing up knowledge for the six and a half billion people who don't have access to it. We are talking about making medicine possible for the six and a half billion who don't have any, who cannot afford it. Because somebody realized it made a greater profit to let millions of people die and look good in the next quarterly report. We are talking about letting billions of people manufacture in ways they couldn't before. Spreading the means of production, as it's called, to corners of the world where it's never been, been before, where people didn't know this was possible. When I see the billions of people, our brothers and sisters around the world, being shut out of the opportunity to learn and to contribute to humanity, I just think what a sad fucking waste and tragedy that is. I'm sorry. There's so much we can do for humanity as a whole here by just tweaking a few parameters of Europe. We really can build a better humanity. We can make higher education available for all seven billion people on the planet. We can allow all seven billion people to contribute their brilliance to what we are building on a daily basis. This is not just about changing the laws of Europe. This is about making it possible to communicate love between billions of people on the planet. This is about making wars impossible to wage because people can see through lies. This is about, in the end, making sure that we can feel like the brothers and sisters we are on this planet. 
and the people in this room today is humanity's best hope towards that mission. We have work to do, and I'm absolutely confident that we can pull it off. And I'm very proud to be able to call myself your colleague in this distinguished crowd. Thank you. story from the past which provides us with the historical perspectives that we need to find the roots of our fight. We've heard also of the challenges ahead, not only for the European Union and its many legislative procedures, but also for the entire world. I hope that our keynotes have given you some food for thought before our talks tomorrow. Um, but unfortunately, before we leave, I will have to provide some uh, operational uh, details. Uh, we should be approximately 250 people in this room. In order to facilitate the European cooperation between equal peers, we have ensured that there are name badges for everyone. These name badges um, are, to my best of understanding, alphabetically organized on a long table if you walk out of the room and towards the elevators, um, and you should be able to find them there. So when you leave the room, please feel free to pick up your own customized name badge. Uh, because we have no particular activi activities planned for the uh, uh, evening, I wanted to give you a heads up on some of the um, uh, quaintness of the Brussels institutional culture. For it is so that every member of the parliament, much like myself, is assisted by a dedicated team of staff members. You will know that many of them are in this, many of the people who work with me are in this room tonight. Staff members in the European institutions and also in the Commission, um, and specifically from the Parliament, every Thursday night gather for a ritual celebration of the departure of the members at Place Luxembourg. Because once the members of parliament depart for their member states to engage in the important communication activities towards their constituencies, they can no longer impose demands on their staff members to work overtime, read papers, and produce policy briefs. Um, therefore, I would sincerely invite you to, to go to Plus Looks and, and check out this very peculiar aspect of Brussels culture. There's plenty of beer and plenty of opportunities for social um, unitement in that place. I thank you very much for coming. And because I very much enjoy um, the small moments of celebration one gets when a large crowd is gathered in applause, I would like to extend a special thank you to the staff members of the European Parliament who have ensured that we can be in this room tonight. They have extended their working schedule, the security routines, and so a special thanks to the staff members of the European Parliament who made it possible for us to be here tonight. And with those small concluding words, you are free to leave if you have any problems. You can contact any member of my staff if they can hold up their hands so that they're easily identified. Galia, Anders, Nils, Julian, Jan Lozhek, they will be perfectly happy. Jan, you need at the film camera also, of course. Thank you. And if, <laughs> and if you have any problems, they will be perfectly happy to assist you in finding your badge or your way around the building.